high. Bounce. Just behind spin and speed, this is probably one of the most talked about aspects of the plastic ball. What the ITTF tests for? Bounce is measured by releasing the ball mechanically without spin, which I've often found strange because spin is an integral part of table tennis and has a huge impact on how a ball bounces. But that's a different topic. The ITTF dropped 24 balls from a height of 305mm onto a steel block. Each ball must rebound to a height between the range of 240 to 260 millimetres. At least that's what the celluloid ball has to do. One of the temporary amendments to T3 allows a non-celluloid ball to bounce between the range 237 to 265 millimetres. So that's slightly lower and higher than the celluloid ball, which I find strange, because if there's going to be a difference, you'd expect it to either be lower or higher, not both but I'll come back to that in a later part in this video. How our tests were done? To try and replicate the ITTF test procedures, I did a bit of home DIY and came up with this. All it is is a shelf support with a pop bottle cap bolted into the top parts of the support. The bottle has then been screwed back into the cap and the bottle itself has had the end cut off to allow me to roll a ball into it. And the label has been removed so you can see the ball rolling inside. As an added bonus, the shape of the bottle automatically draws the ball towards the hole which I've cut on the underside of the bottle and through which the ball will drop. My drop device has been blue tacked to a table to keep it steady. And the table has a glass top which is approximately 6mm thick. To measure the height of the drop, I'm using a combination square which fortunately is exactly 305mm long. As you can see from the square, the table is level. Each ball is then rolled into the bottle three times. Once along the seam, once at right angles to the seam, and the third time I roll it in randomly without checking where the seam is. I've placed a camera on a tripod approximately level with the 24cm mark, because that's roughly how high I'm expecting the balls to bounce, and I want to minimise the effect of the curvature of the lens when I'm filming. I'm stood directly behind the combination square because my black top provides a neutral background for the camera and that helps it focus on the measurements in the combination square and it provides a good contrast to the white ball. To measure the height of the ball I went through all the footage frame by frame until I got to a frame where the ball shape is in focus. This is the point where the ball has stopped moving or to put it another way the point at which it's reached its highest point. A measurement is then taken from the bottom of the ball. Obviously this is not perfect. I'm not dropping the balls onto a steel plate. The balls are rolled into the bottle so there is the possibility of a small amount of forward momentum when the ball drops through the hole and the hole is cut to accommodate the plastic ball and the plastic ball is bigger than the celluloid one. However, the drop height is consistent and the measurements are consistent so in comparative terms at least the results are valid. Our results. Consistency. Here are the results for each of the four boxes of plastic balls. A total of 24 balls were dropped three times with the ball being rolled in the bottle along the seam, across the seam and randomly. That's where you see three pictures for each of the balls tested on the screen now. Notice there's very little visible difference in the height each of these balls is bouncing. And these are the results for the three boxes of celluloid balls. As there are only three balls in a box, that's a total of nine balls dropped three times each. And these are the collated results for all the plastic and celluloid balls. If you're like me, tables and figures are great, but I prefer to see things in a visual form. So here I've superimposed all the marker lines which measure the highest point of bounce of the plastic balls. If you look across the table, based on the geometric mean average of the three drops per ball, the lowest bounce for any one of the plastic balls was 218.332 millimetres. The highest, 221.332. So out of 72 drops, the difference between the highest and lowest geometric mean average bounce was only three millimetres for the plastic ball. That is pretty impressive consistency. And the celluloid balls? 
This time the lowest bounce was 225 and the highest 233.5 mm. And the geometric mean average of 3 drops per celluloid ball shows the lowest bounce height for any one ball to be 227.489 mm and the highest 232.665. That's a difference of 5.176 mm. Or, to put it another way, the celluloid ball is bouncing, or the difference between the bounce, is 72.53% greater than for the plastic ball. But this isn't all our test showed. Comparative bounce heights. Take a look at the comparative bounce height of the jeweler, celluloid and plastic balls. Every single time I tested the bounce of Julius plastic ball, regardless of how I rolled the ball into the bottle, seam up, seam across, random, every single time the plastic ball bounced lower than the lowest bouncing Jula celluloid ball. And that is something which is different to a lot of feedback that I've been reading on the internet regarding the bounce height of the plastic ball. So I repeated these tests, not on glass, but on one of the Jula SC3000 tables we use at our centre. This time I wasn't able to set my camera up so I could get an accurate reading of how high the balls were bouncing. But I could get a comparative measure of plastic versus celluloid ball. Once again, every plastic ball bounced lower than the lowest bouncing celluloid ball. And lastly, because the bounce height of a ball is often more than 305mm above the table, I asked Mike if he'd drop a jeweler celluloid and plastic ball from a much higher height onto one of our tables. Once again, the plastic ball bounced lower than the celluloid ball. Conclusions and observations. Whilst we can't say whether or not these jeweler plastic balls meet T3's bounce conformity requirements, we can say that in our tests, this jeweler Super P40 plus plastic ball, and you can't believe how many times I had to say that before I got it right on film, was more consistent than the celluloid ball and lower. But that's only part of the story. Remember how at the start of this video I mentioned T3's rebound height specification for the plastic ball was both lower and higher than the celluloid ball? In our testing, there will be no need to have a higher limit for this jeweler plastic ball because it never bounced higher than the lowest bouncing celluloid one. So why did the ITTF feel compelled to widen the specifications for the plastic ball? I suspected that when they did the original testing, some of the plastic balls bounced lower and some bounced higher. So to make sure that all the plastic balls would pass the test, which would mean that we'd have more to buy, they widened specifications. I put these suggestions to the ever patient Dr Kunert. He replied that the change in the bounce specification had more to do with improvements in durability. And that's enlightening because it shows how difficult it is to actually make these plastic balls. There are ripple effects going on. Once again, if you change one specification, it'll impact on another. In this case, bounce and durability. And it also means that if you bought one of these balls originally, two, three, four, five months ago, when they were lighter, and you now bought them again, same ball, there's a pretty good chance that not only will they be heavier, that because of that, they might also be more durable. But then again, because you've changed the weight, they're also going to affect the bounce. One ball might bounce higher, one ball might bounce lower, depending on when the specifications were changed. Isn't that going to be difficult for people like you and me? Because when the bounces keep varying, we're going to have to change our technique? I asked Dr Kuna if he thought this was going to be a problem. This is what he said. This change is temporary and minor said the professionals. The reason why we agreed to it. But we're not professionals and the top professionals will often have the luxury of having the equipment provided for them free of charge. Consider this footage. Here I've taken an image of a plastic ball which bounced close to the geometric mean for the plastic balls. And I've overlaid it on a celluloid ball which bounced close to the celluloid ball geometric mean. And now I'm going to vertically align the right hand edge of these two balls. This line I've added represents the face of a bat about to make contact with the top third of the celluloid ball. As the intention is to play a shot similar to a topspin forehand, the bat angle is closed, or to put it another way, the face of the bat is pointing towards the floor. As the bat moves upwards and forwards, contact is made with the celluloid ball. But here's a possible problem. If you rely on muscle memory and play exactly the same shot when you're using Jula's plastic ball, your bat will go over the top of the plastic ball because it bounces lower and you'll miss it completely. 
We'll come back to this in more detail in our video analysing changes players made to their technique as a result of using these plastic balls. But for now it's important to remember that these bounce tests happened with a static ball where there was little or no forward momentum and importantly no spin, something that doesn't happen in the real world. And it's also important for us to put these tests into some type of perspective. Remember, we all play with different equipment, on different tables and different floors, in different temperatures, with different lighting and varying amounts of room. And all these factors will affect how a ball performs or reacts. And we all adapt to these changes, or at least we can if we want to. Thank you for watching.